Hello, everyone, and thanks so much for being here with us. Um, if you would like to, if you haven't had a chance to look at our program, we have a PDF uh, one-page version and a multi-page version with uh, program notes that's available on our website at gutsbaroque.com slash concerts. Thanks so much for joining us, and I'm going to turn it over to John. Hi, welcome. Uh, for today's uh, Guts concert, we're going to be focusing on the music of one of my favorite composers, Moran Murray, and uh, a couple of his students. Uh, Moran Murray was a, a brilliant uh, gamba player. Uh, as a young boy, um, he sang in the choir and at, uh, I forget which local, um, which church, but uh, he was trained as a viol player at the time that his voice broke. And then um, he finished his studies with the great Jean de saint Colomb, who at the time was one of the best viol players in France. Um, Marais, very, very quickly, in the space of something like six months, uh, was said to have surpassed his teacher and was appointed to be the viol player at the uh, newly formed uh, court orchestra at uh, Versailles under uh, Jean-Baptiste Lully, who worked for Louis XIV. Um, Murray also played in the opera and quickly started to compose. Uh, his career very much took off. He became synonymous with viol playing in France. And of course, everyone who wanted to be a viol player went and studied with him. Um, and most of the rest of the program tonight are going to be his students, and there are several more of his students that I intend to play later in a future concert. Anyway, um, the first piece I'm going to play is a short suite. It's part of a giant suite called Suite d'un goût, goût étranger, pardon my French, uh, which means suite in the foreign taste. Um, I'm going to be playing the beginning section, which is an E-flat major and has kind of a Turkish flavor. Uh, the first movement is called Marsh Tartar, which is uh, the march of the Turk. Uh, then there's an Alamand, a Saraband, La Tartarine, who is uh, the Turkish woman, and then uh, Final Gabat. This is from Marais' fourth book, which he published fairly late in his life. Um, after his retirement and after he dedicated himself completely to teaching. And so the pieces in this collection are a lot more whimsical and a lot more experimental. Anyway, I hope you like it.
Wei was known as a very strict teacher. Um, uh, he famously made all of his students play all of his pieces every fortnight, um, which at least some of his students complained about. Um, however, many of his students became very successful viol players that had careers and um, wrote pieces of their own. And uh, when Murray uh, died, then uh, his student Charles Dolay wrote him a fantastic tombeau, uh, which I'm about to play for you. Uh, Charles Dolay um, was a brilliant viol player, although he himself was not able to get a court ap appointment. Uh, apparently he was competing with the great Antoine Fourqueray, and uh, he didn't actually win. But uh, he composed many pieces, actually most of which for the Partissou de Viol, which is the smallest size of viol. It's probably about this big. Um, and it was a very, very popular amateur instrument for women. Um, at the time, it was unseemly for a woman to play the violin, I think mostly because of the collars of their dresses and stuff. Um, and so women very frequently played the Partissou de Viol, the uh, smallest size viol. And most of Dolay's music is for that. However, uh, he did write one collection of pieces for bass viol, which includes this lovely tombeau.
our next piece will give you uh, a little bit of an idea of what the musical life was like in France at the time of Marais students. Uh, this is a violin sonata by Antoine d'Aubaigne. Uh, he was uh, the son of a violinist and he was a very good violinist in and of himself. Um, and he continued in the tradition of uh, Jean-Marie Leclerc in writing uh, very both Italian sounding and French sounding uh, sonatas de chiesa for violin. Um, Dauvergne was active in France right at the end of what is called the Steel Galant era, which is the uh, the area the era right before the beginning of the classical era, when emphasis was placed on beautiful, emotional, touching music, um, more so than form. Anyway, I hope you like this piece.
Thank you very much. That's it for the first half. We'll take a short break and then we'll come back and I will play you some Roland Marais. If you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the chat. We'll be happy to answer them. Say hi. All right. Do you want to ask Peel a couple of questions for us? Um, sure. Okay. I'm trying. It, it, too many characters. Okay. Um, James, I'm trying to answer your question about how do I choose and find the pieces that I perform. I typed you a very thorough answer, and I think it went over the keystroke limit on the chat. Um, anyway, um, I enjoy finding new music. Um, a lot. Uh, whenever I read something about a new composer, uh, a new you know piece, or anything that I can, anything that I hear about, um, I try to find music to it. Um, almost everything is available on the Petrucci Library, uh, www.imslp.org, in either the composer's manuscript or. Uh, early published editions. Um, the pieces that I'm playing off of, um, a lot of them are these, I don't know if you can see it, the lovely Paris editions that were very, very popular um, in the 
early 18th century, um, a lot of them were hand engraved by the publisher Leclerc, and uh, they look really, really beautiful. They're very easy to read. Um, some of them are other older uh, engravers, but these are all engraved uh, by hand so that they could be mass printed and published. Um, so part of part of our kind of mission as an ensemble um, is it's a passion of John's, as he said, to go and find these pieces. But um, as I'm sure those of you who go to classical music concerts find, there are some favorites that show up often. There's sort of like a standard repertoire. Um, and one thing that has been really amazing about um, the internet as it exists is that many libraries around the world and many different um, musicologists and musicians have collaborated to make this Petrucci library um, available. So there's a PDF library of um, images and monochromatic scans of many of these original editions, um, the engravings, and um, in a lot of cases for earlier music, also manuscripts, um, images of the, of the composer's own manuscripts or of hand copied um, versions from the day. So, and those are all out of copyright because these people are long dead. So that's an, a tremendous resource for us. Um, and something that we really like to do is to go and find things that you, composers that you might not have heard of. There's a lot of great music um, that doesn't show up in programs all the time. And so that's a lot of what we are about. We still do play Bach and Vivaldi and Handel and Telemann. Yes, we like that too. But there are just too. so many other composers too. Yeah. So let me, let's take a look at the chat. We also had a question from Shoshana about how much do we practice? Um, and... The honest answer is when you're a grown up, sometimes it, you, it's hard to balance with things, although I, a lot of our students tell us how hard it is to balance with their things. So um, I would say ideally um, about two hours every day, and then we rehearse together um, multiple times per week to put these programs together. So, all right, let's take a look at a couple more questions. Um, when can we play together again? Yeah. Asked Janice, and a uh, similar sentiment uh, expressed by John Robinson. As soon as possible, that yes. is my answer. Yes. I'm looking forward to playing with both of you. Yeah. We've been, um, uh, I've been par participant and party to a few conversations um, recently at, at various webinars and gatherings about what are best practices for um, how to play together across geographic distance. So we, feel so lucky that we're here in the same room and we can make music the old fashioned way and share it with you. Um, but we just certainly want to explore how we can possibly collaborate across distance. Mm -hmm. So, all right, I think, let me just double check. I think that was the last question that I saw. Um, oh, I told them about the playing Murray and the room away forever if you wanted to comment on that oh um the, oh the the um stereotype of viol players that uh we discover concert music and we start playing with everybody and then we discover viol solo music and then we start playing with uh other people like one other person playing continuo and then we discover murray and then we just lock ourselves in closets and play murray forever yeah <laughs> something like that what is it about his music that you love playing so much everything. Uh, first of all, there is so much of it. He published five books of suites, each book containing many suites, uh, somewhere like eight, nine, ten suites. Um, and then, you know, other character pieces. Each piece, they're a little bit formulaic and they all are dances, uh, so they have similar style. Although it, uh, thrown in there, there's a bunch of very wild experimental character pieces. Um, as you're about to find out, um, I, maybe we should segue into starting to introduce the next part of the program. Um, uh, a lot of these French dance suites um, in the style of Moray and uh, continued by his students are um, collections of mixes of dances, fantasies which are just kind of unmeasured uh, 
pieces, uh, at least a couple of the authors that I've read have said more or less to show off. And then these very fun character pieces. Um, Murray very famously wrote character pieces for uh, everything, uh, tombos, which are a tribute to uh, people who've passed away. Um, he's written uh, a, a very famous one about uh, uh, Operation, Operation de la Table, I can't pronounce it correctly, but he went, uh, he underwent a dental operation as an older man. Um, of course, this is before the invention of anesthetic. And then he wrote a very famous piece about it. Uh, perhaps I'll play it for you someday. Um, although it's one of the ones that like everybody plays because it's, you know, it's difficult, but it's fun. Um, but uh, Marais uh, wrote a lot of character pieces and then his students continued the tradition. And so the, their, their suites are a mix of the, the dance forms, which are a little bit formulaic. They all have almost the, pretty much the same number of measures, simple phrases and, uh, you know, regular meters and these character pieces. Um, uh, so the, the second half of the program is the entire thing is going to be taken up by this uh, first suite from book two by Roland Marais. Uh, Roland Marais was the son of Moran Marais. Um, Marais actually had I think 17 children, nine of which survived to adulthood. Um, three of them were fantastic viol players, unfortunately, including one of the ones that didn't survive. Um, and they played in a trio for Louis XIV as young children, and Louis XIV said, they all have great potential. Um, and Roland is the oldest of those three. Um, Roland inherited his father's positions in the opera and in the uh, chamber music um, when his uh, father retired. Um, and everything was going great. Uh, he got married to a wife that he loved very much. He had a son who was the absolute center of his universe. And then in 1728, his father passed away, his wife passed away, and his son passed away in three completely unrelated tragedies. And he uh, apparently retired from the court and was lost to history for about seven or eight years. And then uh, in the 1730s, he finally publishes two books of uh, suites of music for viol, and um, there start being accounts of him playing trios with Antoine Forqueray, the other great viol player, and uh, the violinist uh, Marchand. Um, one of the one of the things that I, at, at one at one hand fascinates me and on the other hand it disappoints me is that even though all of us viol players we all love this music this is the center of our repertoire uh, Marais and his students that they wrote the most and the best pieces for the viol uh, with maybe just a few exceptions scattered throughout uh, Europe and history um, there isn't very much research and there isn't very much like evidence of their life that survives I know that a lot of it is hard to find uh, because the French Revolution happened shortly afterwards and probably a lot of the court records and everything were destroyed. Um, but, you know, uh, compared to the biographies of a lot of these famous composers that we know that, you know, you can buy a, a biography of Bach that is, you know, several volumes long. You can buy a biography of Handel that is several volumes long. Um, even Moran Murray, like, his biography section of any article about him is about a paragraph and any of his students the biography is like well we know he existed because he lived in Paris and published these collections of music and that's about it um, so there's a huge gap in our knowledge that um, I would love it if somebody were to help fill perhaps I can help fill someday if I'm if I can dig stuff up Anyway, I'm about to play this suite in C major by Roland Moray, and this is, I have to say, this is the, the friendliest, most amicable suite I've ever played. I enjoy it a lot.
see if there's questions. All right. So um, before we go to questions, I just had a couple of quick announcements. Um, the first one is thank you all so, so much for being here and sharing this music with us. Um, it's, as I said, it's, I feel very lucky that we're able to play together, um, the two of us, and it's such um, a privilege that we can play still for you. Um, there's people who we know are in the audience, um, some of whom I went to college with and I have never played for in person. Um, we have friends and family from across the country, um, our colleagues who we're separated from. So it's so wonderful that you're here um, and we're really glad. If you haven't had a chance to say a quick hello in the chat, um, and you would like to, we invite you to do that just so we know who's there. We love knowing who's out there. Um, and uh, as I'm sure you have read in many articles, those of you who aren't musicians, um, this is a very scary time for us as live performance is kind of on hiatus for a long, long time. We're kind of, we're expecting to be the last um, sector to recover from all the shutdowns. Um, so we're extremely grateful also that we have some monthly sustaining donors who are here in the audience with us, the virtual audience here today. Um, if you would like to join that, um, we actually, uh, it's important to us to offer these live stream concerts for free. We know that there are some, some 
again, friends and family of ours who are medical professionals, um, others who are musicians who are just as deeply affected by this and not, not just musicians, people of many walks of life. Um, so we want to offer this for free. And also, if you're able to support us during this time, um, we really appreciate that. Um, you can make a one-time donation at our website. And also, if you want to become a monthly sustaining donor, um, you can check out the information at patreon.com slash gutsbaroque. Um, and we will just throw out their suggested $10 donation. Um, usually in in-person concerts, we'll ask uh, for 15, but we know that it's different from being in the same room with us acoustically. Um, and if you choose to make that $10 donation monthly, we would love to see you in a, um, a Zoom uh, virtual reception after the concert. Um, if you'd like to join us there. So, and then we had a couple of questions. Um, I know there was one question about your instrument, John. Okay. Uh, Susanna was asking about your instrument and if you've discovered Tobias Hume. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, let me talk about my instrument. Um, the, this is a seven string vial. Uh, viola da gamba was uh, one of the popular instrument families in use through the Renaissance and Baroque eras. Um, the bass in particular of that family um, was used throughout the Baroque, uh, not just as a continual instrument, but actually very frequently as a bass solo instrument, particularly in France. Um, the seventh string was added to the bottom just to help it keep up with the harpsichord. Um, they kept adding strings to the bottom of the harpsichord, and so they added a seventh string to the bottom of the vial so that it could play the low A that a harpsichord could at the time. Um, uh, it was invented in Italy, but became very, very popular in France, and so most French bass vials have the seventh A string. And uh, to answer your question, uh, yes, absolutely. I, I love the music of Tobias Hume. I performed a uh, number of pieces by him on my graduating recital for my master's degree. Um, I've played them several times since. Um, they're, they're very interesting character and I enjoy them a lot. Um, I like reading them off the, uh, the manuscript of Tobias Hume, for those of you that are curious, is actually written in tablature. It's not written in uh, note heads and, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the typical music notation that we know, there's actually one line for each string and then uh, little letters that represent the different frets of the instrument. And then the rhythm is notated on the top. So it was a little bit of a challenge for me to get used to reading that. Um, but uh, uh, yes, I absolutely love the music of Tobias Hume and I will probably play some of it soon. If you're asking questions about my specific instrument, uh, this is a Lumi file. Uh, was purchased from Lazar's Early Music. I mean, it's it's the most expensive of the Lumi vials, but it's essentially cheap Chinese. It's kind of the cheapest instrument you can buy. Um, I you know, I bought it with my salary from being a cello teacher, so you know I'm not fantastically rich. I'm hoping that over time I will be able to save up more money and buy a nicer instrument. But it's actually it makes a beautiful sound. It's actually louder than most vials. Um, I got the larger size, the uh, size of the Bertrand instrument, and it's pretty easy to play. Um, it's a little, you know, it's a little big and the strings are a little high. So um, when I get to borrow uh, wonderful instruments from my teacher or from other of my friends, they're always, wow, this is so easy to play. But, you know, especially for the price, this is a very nice instrument. Uh, the bow is Louis Béjean, of course, the great, wonderful bow maker in Montreal. Um, other questions? Uh, any information on whether the last suite was based on folk or popular songs? It has that quality about it. Uh, yes, it absolutely does. Um, I don't think anybody has actually done that research. Um, but uh, definitely the music has kind of a folk quality about it. Um, the best I can figure, there's little dedications at the beginning of each movement. Um, I don't know what a lot of them mean. Um, uh, Le Bruneau for the prelude, um, Bruneau is a last name 
I think there's a town called Bruneau, but I find it more likely that it's the name of somebody in Paris, especially since it's a uh, masculine le Bruneau. Um, Gallemand is uh, La Barral, which is a small farming village um, in the province of I forget where. Uh, the, one of the one of the it's now a big uh, commune area. Uh, I forget the name of it, but it's it, at the time it was a simple little farming village. Um, that was the uh, the little Alamand uh, that, with the kind of a cute folksy feel, which yes reinforces what you were saying. Um, Sar Saraband is la uh, I can't pronounce it well la Rinvel, which is. I think a forest. I don't know much about it besides that. Sorry. Uh, R Y N E V V E L D. It might be a last I would, name. I guess I would say Ring Ring Veld, but Ring it's, Veld? it's well. It sounds okay. like it sounds like Rheinveld, as in like the Rhine River. If Probably, I had to guess. I do as good as guess as any, but that that supports the whole like countryside notion. Uh, the Rondeau is uh, Le Montclos who was uh, a, a noble in Paris. Um, I think he was a patron of music, but I haven't found any uh, evidence to actually support that. The Allemand, La Singulaire, uh, because it's very different from anything else, and it's named after La Vandercris, which was a, a newly built mansion in uh, Lille that had really novel architecture. Um, and uh, the Gavat is La Saint-Jacques, which could be a last name, could be a church, could be a town. Uh, there's a lot of Saint-Jacques. Could also be a wine grape, um, which th that was my favorite one that I was going to go with, except that uh, it's uh, feminine La Saint-Jacques, whereas I think if it were the grape, it would be masculine. Um, the Rondeau, the, the, the really folksy sounding Rondeau is... Le Barenge, uh, B, B A R R E N G U E. Barang. Barang. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My French needs work, um, which is another uh, proper name um, of. I have no idea who. I tried to find all this out and I couldn't find anything. The minuets are just called minuets. Anyway, um, so whatever evidence I can find from the music supports that idea that it's very folk based. Um, but, you know, more research needs to be done by me. I'm ashamed. I don't speak French well enough to completely identify everything. And I, I would love to find somebody who knows, like, a who's who of all of the noble families in Paris and what they were all doing. Because I bet I could find a lot of the people in these dedications in that research. But I don't know. And I think we're good. Yeah. All right. Thank you again so much for being here. And we look forward to playing for you again in a month. Um, oh, I was going to have the date right in front of me. We're playing the last, 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 Sunday. last Sunday in June. We'll be back here on YouTube um, with an, another all-new one-hour-ish program for you. So we hope to catch you then. June 28th. June 28th. Thank you. <laughs> we'll see you again here on June 28th. And um, and pa patron patron folks, we'll see you in the Zoom in just a little bit. Have a wonderful rest of your weekend. Be well and safe. Bye bye.